not scale. I mean, it's, just, it's absolutely 100% clear. All of these stats are from the Spanish uh, Chaos Report, a uh, company in Boston. You, you'd be able to Google that Chaos Report and find uh, uh, all of those stats if you pay them five grand and they get the report. You know, it's dollars, so that's like 20 pounds or something. <laughs> uh, and skilled teams, professional teams, are over 200% more likely to succeed than, than unskilled teams. So traditionally, organizations get a bunch of people together and they don't they worry about bums on seats rather than the skills of the individual people. Hopefully everybody here is thinking about the skills of the individual people because you're in a non-software conference. Uh, but those teams are much more likely to succeed and there's data around that to take to your organizations and show that you need more skilled people uh, uh, in those uh, organizations and teams. So what I want to look at is effectively, DevOps is all about being able to deliver quickly and effectively, but you need to be able to do it at scale. DevOps on the small scale is, is pretty easy. If we're building a small app that we can just, you know, three or four people working on it and we can just ship it, we don't necessarily need a lot of automation to be able to ship. It would be awesome to have automation, yes, but we don't need it to ship because it's small, it's easy, it's quick to, to get that thing out the door. But doing that at scale, um, I'm working with a company right now in Oslo who has 60 teams in 12 different countries. That's a lot of team, and they're building one product. So one binary is shipped that has all of those teams working on it, and they ship on a monthly basis. Lots of automation. They are not particularly agile. We, we need tons of automation, automated integration, automated systems. So the first thing I want to look at is whether it's worth the cost to, to, to scale up. How many people work on a product with more than one team working on it? And I'm thinking more, more, than, more than nine people. Okay, it's hard, because you've then got communication. You've then got um, integrating your work. It's much harder to do that. So is it worth the cost? Because this is what we think happens when we add more teams. Yeah, well, this is what managers think happens when we add more teams. So if we have two teams, we'll deliver twice as much stuff. It's just, just not the case. What, it's just not, not, not gonna happen. What really happens is this. As you add more teams, there's a point at which the complexity gets so bad that it's just, you know, here we go. 10 teams could deliver less than five teams. It's not good, not where you want to be. So what can we do instead? Wouldn't it be better if we could take one team and have them deliver more? Wouldn't that be better? Rather than putting two teams together and only getting 30% of the of improvement Let's take one team and make them twice as good. Training, automation, scrum. If you guys are, are, are looking at agility, you're probably doing some form of scrum or taking ideas from scrum. MD, who's doing scrum here? Okay, Kanban, a few teams. Well, you guys are probably doing everything. Yeah, the customers, and they want you to do whatever they want you to do. We have different side projects. I would absolutely 100% disagree. In fact, it worked better with high dependencies, but I'm going to talk about that. Um, but Kanban's, Kanban is an awesome uh, uh, way of improving your process. That's what it's designed for. Kanban is not designed for building stuff. Okay? Kanban is designed to improve your process so you can build stuff, to build your own process to build stuff. Scrum is designed to build stuff, but it only works well for creative work. It doesn't work well for well-defined work. Does that make sense, everybody? So if you're building a car um, in a production line, you probably don't want to use Scrum because it's, it's buckets of work. Whereas if you're designing that car, you might want to use Scrum. Toyota, for example, use Kanban on their production lines to monitor flow and improve their process, but they use Kanban with something that looks a little bit like Scrum in their product design lifecycle. Because designing products, you don't know how long it's going to take. You don't know. Anytime you don't know, you need an empirical process. Build a bit, look at what you've done, change. And keep iterating. And that's what Scrum's good at, is getting the, those iterations. Depends on the length of your iterations, all kind of things. But everybody's familiar with the Scrum process, so they don't want to spend too much time on it. Uh, but you can get the Scrum Guide from scrum.org, um, and that has the, the, the rules. Um, it's the difference between, you've got the, the, the practices, 
they might work for your organization. Yeah, like doing story points. Can we do story points? I do story points. Does it work for every one of my customers? No. So it's just a practice. It's just a thing that might help or might not. But the core part of Scrum, the rulebook, is kind of like when you buy Monopoly. You expect it to come with a rulebook, not strategy again. This is the rulebook, and then you can build whatever strategies on top if that makes sense. And one of those strategies is to get to this thing called professional Scrum. And yes, it's capital P. I work with Scrum.org. Their mantra is to improve the profession of software development. And the first thing we need is for it to be a profession. How many people here are members of the BCS? Only a few. How many people are here are software developers? OK, you all need to join the BCS. That's a profession. That's a body with knowledge that is helping everybody improve uh, uh, their knowledge and improve their practices. Yeah. So there's kind of three pillars. You start, you always start with mechanical process. I'm calling it mechanical scrum. We're just following the rules. That's what most people do, we just follow the rules. You're gonna get about 10% of the value from just following the rules, but you'll get some value. You then need to add two things. The values and principles, if you look at the Agile Manifesto, that's talking about the values and principles, and developer skill, yeah? And when I say, hey, who's here as testers? Any testers? No, because, you know, I test stuff. So, um, the, when I say developers, I mean coders and testers and VAs and whoever you need to build your software, i.e. cross-functional teams of developers, development teams. Um, and to create those professional teams, you need that technical excellence. You need to understand the technology and be able to do those things. Because, you know, the domain that you're working in is probably hard enough to understand without not understanding the technology as well. Whether you're doing ASP.NET, Java, whatever it is you'd be doing. So, the only foundation to be able to scale is being professional. Yeah? <coughs> so, everybody uh, uh, familiar with like uh, uh, scaling frameworks? Safe, DAD, uh, what are the other ones? Any, any names? Yep. There's lots of them. There's lots of these. Uh, I call them cookie cutter because, you know, I don't know what the British blueprint expression might be equivalent here. You've got this blueprint, and we're just going to take this blueprint and apply it to a different company. It worked over here, so it must work over here. Yeah, that that, that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? But does it? Because, you know, culture gets in the way. Every organization with culture is different. And our culture is, that's how we do things around here. Some stuff you might want to change. Some stuff you're stuck with, it might be a larger organization that you're working within, and you kind of have to roll with it. So what does that look like? Well, you've got, if you're ever familiar with the Snyder model, probably not, you can Google it and find out a little bit more about it, but you've got two axes in the Snyder model to see where you kind of fit. One is people orientated to company orientated. So big enterprise companies tend to be over here somewhere and little companies tend to be over there, but everybody wants to be over there. We want to be people orientated. Yeah? We want to focus on the right people to deliver the software, because that's what gets us awesome software and happy customers. And then we've got possibility, so innovation at the bottom, and reality orientated. That's doing, doing the safe thing, being creative. Because they're kind of opposite. You need to be a little bit risky to be creative. Yeah, you need to be able to willing to experiment, willing to do the wrong thing, get it wrong, and then change and do something else. And it's about where you sit. And there are um, this is about getting and keeping control. So I I work with enterprises that are like way up here. Like everything must be the way they want. It. And you can imagine the kind of words that go around with that: order, power, uh, standardization. Anybody got standardized coding rules? Yep, one person, so big enterprise? No. No little company? Uh, yeah, you know, growing, but yeah. Yeah, we, so you take, the danger is going too far in this direction, we need some of this stuff. Some of this stuff's good, but too much is bad because it constrains people's creativity. You need to be able to be creative. And this is all about control. Big companies love control. So. Down here, this quadrant is about being the best. Yeah? So
So when we're being the best craftsmanship, professionalism, efficiency, achievement, all those things are important for that company. And I'm sure you see some of these words in your company to different degrees, but some companies sit very squarely here. And that's a good place to be because we're innovation, innovating, but we've still got very impersonal. Yeah? People might not be happy in that space, but we are building something that's awesome. So that's competence. And then up here, we've got, we succeed by working together. That's where we tend not to have a lot of innovation, but we're very focused on people. How many companies work at, how many people work in a company with the, the what's the award that you get in the UK, the in, Investing People Award, yeah? You probably see some of those synergy, affiliation, interaction, partnership, people, people trying to, but, you know, we're still being less risky than we kind of need to be to innovate. And then there's the kind of sweet spot for a lot of people, especially uh, um, startups, is down here. We succeed by growing people who fulfill our vision. That's kind of the, the best of both worlds. Creativity, evolution, yeah, subject. Cultivation, we're cultivating people and products and uh, making cool things. It's not the place for everybody, but what you have to think about right now, where does your company sit? Yeah? Where would your company sit on this graph? And are you all thinking of the same place? No. No two people are thinking of the same place. Probably no two people in the same company are thinking of the same place. Yeah? Because it's different from different perspectives. So if we have a company A, and we want to get to B, is it a straight line? Is culture like that? Can we just say, tomorrow we're going to implement Six Sigma and be awesome and over here somewhere else? It doesn't work that way. It kind of more, hopefully, looks like that. We go on a kind of journey. And each journey is different. So not only is our starting point different and where we want to get to different, but our journey is different. So how can we just take a blueprint and implement it? It doesn't work. There's too much friction. And then it fails. How many agile transformations do you see fail? Almost all of them, because most of them use a blueprint. And it doesn't work. Bring in a consulting company with a blueprint. What you need is some way to grow your own process, have some structure and bones around it so that you can make your own process. Does that make sense? Your process will be unique to your company. So, Scrum.org have something called Nexus is what they're trying to achieve with this. This is kind of, it's kind of V1 document. They've just released the Nexus guide. It's all open source. You can go and download it. Use it within your company. And there are loads of companies that I, I talk about this with and they're like, yeah, but we're already doing that. Awesome. That's because it's all kind of common sense stuff. Scrum itself, lots of companies were doing Scrum before it was called Scrum because it's just, let's figure out how to inspect and adapt in an effective manner and it kind of makes sense. So they've come up with this idea of, we have the Scrum framework, yeah, so we just want to build on this because we know this works. Companies are hugely successful with Scrum and derivatives of Scrum. So we need a little bit more in the Nexus world. I'm not going to go through this because I want to talk about them individually. But we have some new things. If you're familiar with Scrum, we have a couple of new things. So you have a sprint planning at the beginning of your sprint. And we kind of need something before that because we've got dependencies. As soon as you get more than two teams, in fact, more than one team working together, you're going to have dependencies between the teams. And while you want to try and avoid those things, man, that's a scary place to be. I'm dependent. We need to deliver at the end of this two weeks. But we're dependent on something you might or might not do in the next two weeks. That's hard. And we need some way to, to figure that out. So we need a, a kind of meeting before we have our sprint planning. Each team is going to have their sprint planning independently. But we need a meeting to kind of get that together and figure out what those dependencies are so we can focus on them. And then we have a nexus backlog because, you know, if we've got 60 teams working on one product, there's a lot of stuff underway and we need a holistic view about everything that's going on. Each team needs a view on their piece, but you also need a holistic view. So the chances of being able to do that with stickies on a wall starts to get much lower. Might be 
possible if you're co-located and maybe six or seven teams. 60 teams, 12 different countries, not going to happen. You need some sort of tools for that, whether it's uh, uh, JIRA or TFS or um, if you're really crazy, HP, but hopefully nobody's that crazy. Um, but there are, are lots of tools out there for that, lots of effective tools. And then we're going to iterate, creating an integrated work. I don't know if you're, at the end of every sprint, you're supposed to be create fully integrated work for your product. You're supposed to be able to ship your product at the end of every sprint. So the more teams you have, the more time you've got to spend working together to create that working piece of software. Yeah, no, it's not good enough for you to create a piece of working software and you to create a piece of working software in two separate <coughs> teams. If it's not integrated together, you can't ship it. There's more work to do to ship it. That's not where you want to be. It needs to be fully integrated software. So what do you need there? Automation. That's what these cogs sig signify is automation. Um, anybody familiar with Microsoft's recent transformation? Microsoft has recently moved from you know being the traditional waterfall organization to being pretty agile. And anybody uh, uh, Windows 10 Insider? I was. I got new builds every two weeks here on the fast right. A whole build of an operating system that installed every two weeks. Do you mind how many people work on the Windows team? They've got uh, over a million work items in flight at any point in time. It's a big team. Lots of people in lots of different countries working together, yet they were able to pull it off badly, I believe. <laughs> but you need to, it takes time to change. You only start to change once you have pressure to change. So they started moving towards agility, they hit a bunch of obstacles, they fall over, and then it's about picking yourself back up and figuring out how to move forward. The TFS team are a prime example. They moved in two years from shipping a product on a two yearly cycle to shipping a product to production every three weeks. Visual Studio Online ships to production every two weeks. Yeah, and that's, they have over a million Infrastructure and they don't have any ops teams. There's no ops team in Visual Studio Online, the developers support it. That's part of the DevOps ideas. I, I DevOps in my title, and I'm going to start talking about it in a minute, but DevOps is not about having a team called the DevOps team or somebody called the DevOps engineer. It's it's principles and practices. It's not a thing that you can just go do. It's a bunch of principles and practices to help you move towards getting to production faster. So if you want to get to production faster, you can't be handing off stuff that you don't care about anymore to another team. If you get a wall between dev and ops, and dev go, I built it, it works here, shit, and ops go, what the fuck? If I'm going to try and deploy it, and it takes me six hours to deploy it, then that's not good. I actually worked with a customer where I sat with the ops team doing deployments, and they were dragging and dropping different versions of DLLs built from different builds onto the production servers and then testing it to see if it worked. Yeah, because they had no clue whatsoever what went together, what worked together, anything at all. That's insanity. It's like 18 weeks to do a deployment. I think of craziness. You should be able to deploy really quickly. The TFS team roll out across globally to a million instances in, in days. And it's all automated. You need that automation. And in order to manage that automation, you might need some help. Okay? So we have this idea of the integration team. And it's called the integration team so that it's not called the DevOps team, so people don't think DevOps is a team. But this is your team that is responsible and accountable for implementing those practices and principles of DevOps, of application lifecycle management, of whatever you want to call those things that you need to do to ship working software quickly. So the integration team shouldn't do the work. I want to make that really super clear. Shouldn't ever do the work. They are responsible and accountable for the work happening, but they need to help facilitate that work from the teams that they're working with. Now they may be a non-permanent team. In, I, get, I work with a permanent integration team of nine full-time people because we've got 60 teams across the world in one product, yeah? We need them full time. And they're firefighting quite a lot because it's craziness. But cultures, cultures are critical for different teams all over the world. But that integration
integration team is really like a team of software-based Scrum Masters. Scrum Masters are facilitators, they're not doing the stuff, they're helping facilitate the team working together. Yeah? These are the software equivalent integration team members of the software equivalent. They, they know automation, they know TDD, they know how to do a lot of those things, and we're going to go and help the team figure out what they need to do to achieve it and help them achieve it. They're going to do the work. In small orgs, if you have two teams working on a piece of software, this might be two guys that are part-time representatives who are already part of the other team and they just volunteer to help work together on that. This happens naturally in a lot of organizations. You probably have somebody in your organization who takes ownership of that thing and then somebody else says, well, does it make sense to have one person? Shouldn't we have two in case they're off on holiday? And you've got an integration team. The bigger you are, the bigger that team is. But again, it's a scrum team, so six plus or minus three. Don't want to be too big. It's a little bit difficult. Not really what we do in five minutes, like what we can do in a few years and we just need to Five minutes of yeah. no, I'm good for five minutes. Good. <laughs> so afterwards we got a review where we're showing that working software of everything integrated together. Not different teams showing their own stuff, it's one thing they're showing, one binary. Life's more complicated than that, but that's the idea is one thing. And then we go into a retrospective. Anybody do retrospectives here? Hopefully everybody does retrospective because it's the, on, the only way to adapt is to you know look first. Are we doing the right thing and then change? And for the retrospective, we kind of need two Nexus meetings because we need to get, to get at the Nexus level, the whole product level. What were the problems that the team can't see? But you want the team to figure out how to solve those problems because they're your smart people doing the work. So spread that knowledge to the teams. So meet first, representatives from each team, get together, go, awesome. We know what the problems were, take that out to the teams, figure out awesome solutions, and then bring them back. That's really what that's all about. Because that's what, you don't need to employ separate smart people. You want your smart people building software because that's where the value is. That's where we're spending our money. That's what we want is working software. So don't have all, you don't need all these other experts, you want the experts in the teams. So borrow them, that's the best way. So this, this framework allows you to use the Scrum ideals with minimal amount of extra work in order to help organize that process going forward so that you can scale your teams. Remember, don't scale unless you have to, but have more teams working together and deliver more software. Loads more resources on uh, um, Scrum.org website. Okay, and there's uh, I think in the next, I'll figure out what the next event is for you as well. So just like that's the rule book, there's a bunch of practices to help. And I'm sure you there'll be presentations here on some of these practices and how to implement them. But I just want to mention a few of them that are a good idea. I've got a few minutes left. I probably have uh, uh, more. Um, dependencies and reification is a really silly word that I don't like. It's come to argue it all the time, but it means just figuring out your dependencies and making sure that they're not hampering each other. So be aware of your dependencies between teams. Uh, it's really difficult if you've got component teams. Yeah, if you've got two components or layers, database layer and the DBAs on the database layer, and then the middle tier layer that's written in Java that's owned by the Java guys and then the front end that's owned by the .NET guys. I've worked in a company like that. It's a nightmare because you're creating more dependencies than you need. Nobody can build a piece of software. No one team can ship anything, can build anything. It's all the dependencies. Whereas you're better focusing on feature teams. Uh, one thing at once. Focus on doing one thing at once. You will always deliver faster focusing on one thing at once than showing progress on multiple things at the same time. Okay? And I have a whole deck on just that, but not today. So numbers, this is, uh, you can look up the data, but if you're doing five things at once, you're probably losing 80% of your time to task, task switching. And scrum teams are meant to be focused 100% on one thing. I'm a member of that team. Scrum teams are said to work 24 hours. 
you know why they've said to work about 24 hours? Because in my downtime, when I'm in the shower, I'm taking the kids to the park, the back of my brain is thinking about the problems of that scrum team, of solving the software problems, and then you come up with solutions. If you're working on five things at once, what's your brain thinking about? How do I juggle those five things? All that wasted time, even more wasted time, is useless. Focus on one thing at once. This is good evidence for taking to your project managers or whoever you need to, directors. Um, scaling, start with one team and grow from there. Get one good team and then start scaling out. Uh, there's something called the, the um, Scrum Studio that Ken Swaver talks about in his book that's um, um, get, if you're gonna move towards Scrum or move towards agility, get one team doing that 100% in it within a bubble, give them projects, and then as they're able to deliver effectively, other people will want them to do more work, and then you'll need two teams, and then you'll need three teams, and this will grow, and this will shrink. That's the most effective way to move towards agility. It's a little bit ninja, but if it's a good executive buy-in, it works really well. Uh, feature teams, vertical slices. Minimize your dependencies. Yeah, always have teams that can do the full full stack. One team should be able to be given a feature on their own and deliver a piece of working software. So don't have uh, uh, individual services teams. It can be difficult because you've got scarce resources like DBA. Who get one DBA and three teams? What do we do? Measure it out. That's why you get smart teams. Microservices, that's the hot topic these days. Everybody's got to mention microservices in their talk. That's the only reason I kept this one in there. Uh, but microservices are good for breaking up your platform so that teams can take an individual thing and iterate on it quickly. This stops you having to scale because you're then not one building one monolithic product, you're building lots of little products and all the teams are then no longer scaling teams because they're no longer really interacting in that way. Very powerful feature. Microsoft's moving to that wholesale behind the scenes. Lots of, lots of microservices work very much. So lots of things can uh, uh, complicate your world. Um, geographic location, platforms, all those things. Uh, have personas for your software. Who are you building your software for? Understand them and their motivations. This is, I can't remember whose this is, it's, it's definitely from one of the Microsoft Teams, um, but this is Thomas's, one of their uh, uh, personas that they use. So that team building software is thinking about what Thomas wants. And he has a whole back, there's more than this, this is just like the poster that they have on the wall, there's like a whole backstory of, they even have videos of Thomas's life. Because then you understand your users better. When your users are millions and millions of people, it's hard to focus in on what are our individual people that we're targeting, who are we providing value for. Use a tool, make sure your tool supports metadata and not Excel. Okay, because you can't have two people editing an Excel document at the same time. I heavily push TFS, uh, Visual Studio Online, so no, you don't have to have a Windows server anywhere if you're a Java guy. Use Visual Studio Online and you don't care where the hell it is, it's in the cloud. Um, works, works really well, it's built by a team that is using their software to build their agile software, so there's a lot of dog fooding going on and they're iterating very quickly, and yes, bits suck, but every time a bit sucks, a few weeks later it's better, which is kind of nice. Um, a lot of the big vendors are not iterating that fast, and this is holistically. There are, there are better work item tracking tools out there, yeah, but holistically, I've got build integrated with work item tracking, integrated with source code, and I get full traceability through the entire chain. That's hard to get with independent software, but you can make your own tool set, but then you've got to support that as well. That's why I like TFS, because you can get up and running with this without any build work item tracking and automated deployment in about 30 minutes for a product. I've done that before for customers, and I'm like, holy crap, how did you manage to do that? Well, Mickey Mouse, Microsoft stuff, it's easy. Not like Java stuff. Uh, get telemetry from your software. Uh, you'll all be familiar with Google Ana Analytics. You probably all run websites in your spare time and use Google Analytics to track how many users you've got, what they're doing on your site. Tell there are loads of telemetry tools out there for understanding how people are flowing through your software, what buttons are clicking, whether you've got desktop software, mobile software, what they're interacting with, understand what they're using, because don't build stuff that they're not using. That's what most people do. Uh, uh, how long have I got? A minute, now she's gone. Awesome, I can go as long as I like. Um, I've got a customer in the US, a bank, who 
who thought it was about 30% of their software was awesome and everybody used it because, you know, they thought we did themselves. And they did a study, put the telemetry in. 10%. Oh, no. 10%. Uh, so, are there any questions? Uh, you'll get the rest of the stuff in the deck. But. Yes, so if you want uh, you to talk about stuff, I'll probably write something on the board anyway, but there'll be an open space. And if you want to chat about stuff, then are we actually getting kicked out? Well, 35 minutes. 35 minutes goes to 45. Should like I, I know, I know. Catching up. That's okay. Uh, I have a, a blog. You can contact me through my website. I have business cards in my back pocket, and I'll try and be at the open space. So if you want to talk about anything from TFS to Scrum, to scaling, whatever.